All right, everyone. Um, awesome. All right, guys. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. I'm really excited uh, to, to welcome Kelly McGonigal to, um, to Basecamp today. Um, Kelly's a, a health psychologist, a lecturer at Stanford University, uh, known for her work in the field of science help, which focuses really on translating insights from a whole bunch of fields, but making them actionable and accessible um, to support health and well-being. Um, she's the author of three amazing books, The Willpower Instinct, The Upside of Stress, and The Joy of Movement, one that we're going to dive in on today. But I um, couldn't be more excited to welcome Kelly to, uh, to Basecamp and very much looking forward to the conversation. So Kelly, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And hello, everyone. Awesome. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, um, so let's see, I, I like to frame these up a little bit in terms of like, what's the what's the problem that we're talking about? And um, maybe sounds like a little bit of a negative way to approach this, but I think really the problem is, and I just became so appreciative of this as I was reading uh, The Joy of Movement, Kelly, is that we've really lost touch with the potential that movement affords us to unlock our full potential and that we, we're missing out on a key part of our existence if we're not um, moving the way that we can or the may, maybe the way that um, not only that we're capable of, but that we should. So there's a lot of opportunity as it relates to movement. Um, but I'm curious, even before we get in on that topic, what made you write this book and what is it about this area of research that got you interested uh, in this area? Yeah, I mean, I guess I always view the central problem for all the work that I do as just human suffering. So like I would define the problem as um, it's hard to be human and we all experience pain and loneliness and sadness and anxiety uh, and want to be happy and experience connection and hope and courage. So everything that I do is in service of tackling that problem. Um, when it comes to movement, you know, I wrote this book because even though publicly, I'm better known as a psychologist um, or a researcher. I've been teaching group movement classes for more than 20 years and uh, basically my entire life. Exercise of some form, particularly group fitness and dance um, has been the single most important thing that I've done for my mental health and my ability to um, find community and find belonging. So this book was my opportunity to leverage the science and the psychology and all of the research and really um, help other people discover movement as an antidote to these epidemics of loneliness and depression and anxiety and really start to find a way of um, you know, seeing the body not as something that needs to be fixed or controlled through exercise, but that the body is a vehicle for experiencing competition and play and pleasure and grace and strength and vitality and speed and power and all of these other amazing ways that we can we can be in our bodies and that when we choose to do that as you said it unlocks these amazing other human attributes um, that we we can realize our full potential and that that movement is a vehicle for that that's amazing the um it's it's funny i mean I imagine people that are listening are thinking to themselves like, you know, I've always known that exercise is good for me or that it's good to be fit or that it's good to move. Um, and I th so I think it's maybe widely accepted. I think, you know, certainly widely known that movement is good for us and exercise is good for us. But even though we know that something can be, that it is good for us, we still avoid it. Maybe we don't engage with it. And I'm curious as you cover so many different forms of movement in the book and you cover so many different um, not only forms and styles, but mindsets that you can approach movement with. I'm curious as you were going through that, did, did something start to reveal itself as to why we don't move our bodies more? Like what is that thing that blocks us from engaging? This and there are that's so good for us. So many reasons. Like one of the other sort of core tenets of all of my work is that human beings are complex and we always have competing instincts. So at a very basic level, although our brains and bodies reward us for movement, they they reward us for exerting ourselves, uh, for working hard, for persisting, all of that. Um, we also are built with an instinct to avoid overexertion, to conserve energy. Um, to rest, to avoid discomfort, which a lot of forms of movement can be, to avoid failure or embarrassment, which a lot of people associate with trying new forms of movement or exercise. So there are a lot of instincts that are working against also our, our body and our brains um, 
ability to reward us for movement. So I think at like first we just start with some basic self-compassion. Like it makes a lot of sense. And even you will never meet anyone more in love with exercise than me. And still every morning when I wake up, my first instinct is I don't want to get out of bed. And also I really do want to get out of bed and because I exercise first thing. And I try to support myself. I make my cold brew coffee the night before. I put my exercise clothes out the night before. But still, even like this morning, I had to say to myself, okay, Kelly, you're getting up, you're doing grit strength and it's for you. And you do want to do this, even though I didn't want to do it. So that's just sort of a natural basic, you know, competition of selves. We've all got that. But also you mentioned mindsets and in many cultures, people associate exercise as a, a punishment for pleasure, like I have to work off what I ate or what I drank. Uh, I was so bad yesterday that I indulged too much. Now I need to repent with exercise. They are tracking themselves with a sense of judgment, like how many calories have I burned or you know, did I go harder or faster than I did yesterday? Um, and a lot of things in the fitness industry and culture really reinforce that. So that a lot of people's direct experience of movement is self-critical, punitive. They look for the thing that is, is feels the worst because they assume that'll be the thing that's best for them. Um, so there's just a lot of stuff that if you, if you don't view movement as an inherent good, if you view it as something you have to do, um, and particularly you have to do it because you did something else that was pleasurable or that was meaningful. And like, this is how you undo the negative effects of that. Um, you really actually lose the ability to experience the pleasure, the meaning, the purpose, the connection uh, in movement. And so, you know, that's one of the first mindsets to put aside, even though, like, of course, it's true that exercise is good for your body. That is obviously true. And yet the research also shows that the more you focus on controlling or perfecting or changing your body, whether it's your appearance or your weight, um, or even disease prevention, the more you focus on that, the less likely you are to stick with movement, the less likely you are to find a form of movement that you love. And so the less likely you are to experience any of the benefits, whether it's the physical, the emotional, or the social benefits. Wow, wow. Um, you, you touched on a number of things there, but I think you know what seems super accessible to me and just on the service is this idea that um, movement can be the reward. And if you're using movement as as a means to an end, then you're missing out on the full opportunity that comes from movement. And, and you may in fact even be prohibiting yourself from moving as much as you might otherwise like to. And so yeah. this idea that the practice is, is itself, itself can be super rewarding, um, I think is, it really, really resonates. And we should, can, can I define for a second oh, what please. rewarding means? Because the research also is pretty clear that there are three motivations that keep people moving. One is enjoyment. So one way of thinking that movement is rewarding is you're doing something you actually enjoy. You're playing sports, you're going for a walk, you're swimming, you're dancing, whatever it is. You actually like it. Like you would do it even if it didn't have all of the extra benefits for your physical health and mental health. Um, that's one. Another is if it provides social connection or community or positive sense of identity. Like I'm a runner and I run with my training group and, and I'm training for a race. Um, that it gives you this, this positive social connection and belonging and meaning. And then the third is if it's a personal challenge. So you are doing something that's interesting to you. It's meaningful to you. It's new to you and it's hard and you're putting in the effort and presumably you're getting better uh, and you're making progress towards um, something that's cool to you, whether it's lifting more weight or learning a new physical skill or working towards um, you know, some adventure climb that you're going on or learning complicated choreography in a dance class. Um, so that's it, enjoyment, connection, and this kind of positive challenge or meaning. And so when people ask me, you know, how do I get started if, if they're not regularly active, to see if any of those are particularly appealing or if you can think of any form of movement that would be inherently enjoyable, that would put you in a community that is appealing to you, or that's a positive challenge you want to take on. And it, that it immediately takes a lot of the, the stress off of movement. And you think about, all right, there's these three opportunities, these three motivations, enjoyment, connection, 
challenge, like pick which one works. I get to choose my own adventure, pick which, which one works for me and then start in the smallest way possible. I think is, is awesome. Well, and then um, you find the activity that gives you all three and you're hooked for life. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You talk about in, in, in the joy movement, you talk about this concept of the runner's high and, and probably some of us on or listening have felt that maybe others have heard about it. Uh, I particularly don't like running long distances. So <laughs> this is not something that I access very frequently, but um, this concept, and I think it's really interesting is that the body is designed to reward persistence. Mm -hmm. um, and that runner's high is not unique to running, that it can be found in a whole host of activities. I'm wondering, and you, and you use the Hadza tribe as a way to communicate and articulate what's going on there. But I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that in the runner's high and the, the, the body rewarding persistence. Yeah. So um, first of all, I totally agree with you. I'm not a runner. I don't know that I've ever had a run at runner's high because I don't think I can run long enough. Running is a very unique skill. People who are runners know you have to train for it. So I could, I could like dance or do like hit all day long, but if I have to continuously run, I'm like on the ground, it's not happening. Um, so you don't have to run to get this reward. But the idea is that one of the things that has allowed humans to adapt and survive over hundreds of thousands of years uh, and longer is that at some point um, we found a way to persist to hunt and gather and forage food that we had to become much more active uh, in order to nourish ourselves and our community and survive and so we evolved all sorts of physical characteristics that made walking and hiking and running easier. That's sort of the, the idea of the born to run idea. Um, but what I'm really interested in is it's not just our physical bodies that seem to change, that our brains hijacked the basic reward system, the thing that makes you know, food rewarding or sex rewarding um, or play rewarding. And it found a way to create this neurochemical reward for physical persistence. Um, and it kicks in when you, you've been engaging in some kind of physical effort for about 20 minutes or more, you know, continuous effort, moderate intensity. So basically anything that people would do for exercise is probably going to qualify for this. Um, but again, the idea is that, that humans have been able to survive and thrive because when we are pursuing meaningful goals that are difficult, our brains recognize it and start to release chemicals that increase energy, increase motivation. Um, they are endocannabinoids primarily, although movement will also give you adrenaline and uh, dopamine and sometimes endorphins, depending on what you're doing and how hard it is. Um, but endocannabinoids are these, this class of brain chemicals that you know, if you ask someone, what does a runner's high feel like or what does an exercise high feel like, they'll talk about two different sort of streams. One is all the negative stuff in your head and your body that gets quieter, physical pain, fatigue, stress, worry, self-doubt, all of that anger, uh, that becomes quieter. So you start to feel this kind of calm and all the discomfort in your body that's starting to quiet down. And there's also this other stream of really enhanced positive experiences. So you feel good, you feel powerful, you feel confident and hopeful. Um, anything that's pleasurable is more pleasurable and uh, particularly social interaction. So like a conversation or physical touch, cooperation, play, all of that shared laughter, that becomes really rewarding. And that's the neurochemistry of an exercise high. That's what your brain does to motivate you to keep pursuing uh, something important that requires physical effort and, and psychological persistence. So I think that's pretty cool because, you know, what it means is anytime you engage in regular activity, you're becoming this version of yourself that is more hopeful, more motivated, more energized, and also better able to connect with others. And uh, the research suggests that although this chemistry might peak, in your workout and for like the hour afterwards, there's this weird upward spiral effect where you basically benefit from that for the rest of the day with all of your interactions, you're more likely to make progress on important goals. Things that are really stressful are less likely to take a toll on your well being. This is one of the reasons, by the way, why I exercise first thing in the morning, even though you heard me say how much I hate getting out of bed in the morning. I would have, if I were like training for the Olympics, I definitely would be like trying to 
time my training for when I have peak energy and focus and it's not six in the morning, but I train then because I want the upward spiral. I want everything I do afterwards to be the version of myself that I am after I'm all hopped up on my endocannabinoids and endorphins. It's amazing. I, I it's, it's funny and, and I'm, I'm sure not the only one, but when you hear endocannabinoids, you, a lot of people probably think of cannabis and marijuana yes. and it's a little different what happens when you exercise, but it's the, you know, cannabis is mimicking that natural brain chemical. Yeah. You, you, you make a really great point in that you say, you say when it, when you compare the, the neurochemistry of exercise and what's going on in our brain and whether it's with endocannabinoids, I always struggle with that word, I dopamine, know. serotonin, BDNF, whatever's going on, that um, there's a difference between movement and the brain chemistry that it produces and drugs. And, and the way that you frame it is that is, is instead of annihilating your capacity for pleasure, exercise expands it, which I think is just yeah. is such a beautiful message. And I know you, you draw this, this, this connection between, you know, persistence high and a cannabis buzz or synchronized movement and ecstasy or <laughs> moving to music and stimulants or green exercise and, uh, and theogens, which ayahuasca, LSD, psilocybin, but yeah. you can draw these connections where you can start to elicit some of the same effects. But to your point, you're actually expanding your capacity to experience these states of mind by constricting it. Um, maybe yeah. I'd love your, I don't know if you could yeah, talk I think this that. is a really important point because, you know, I'm not someone who is going to moralize about substance use and experimentation, but there is, there is science showing that uh, a lot of these substances, if you have a vulnerability uh, and become dependent on them, one of the, the main general ways that all of them affect your brain uh, over time is they actually interfere with the reward system. Um, they, they trigger what's sometimes called the anti-reward system in addiction research. It's the idea that your brain's capacity to give you pleasure and hope and motivation and positive emotions for basically everything other than the drug that you become dependent on that deteriorates. That's actually, the drug is actually doing that to your brain and it's not everyone. And it's not, you know, all circumstances, but for people who suffer from addiction, they'll recognize that side effect. And so what's really interesting is uh, a lot of things that we get addicted to that do give us initially pleasure or create these really interesting changes in your brain that give you spiritual experiences or help you connect with others or make you feel euphoric. Um, those substances tend to turn on you eventually, but exercise for whatever reason activates a lot of those same pathways, a lot of the same biochemistry, but for whatever reason, as a, the natural form of releasing those chemicals, they teach your brain how to access them spontaneously in response to life. So after regular exercise, your brain becomes more responsive to all positive emotions and positive experiences and pleasure. You actually see changes in the brain, like an increase in the availability of dopamine receptors, which is basically like, if you think of, you know, dopamine is something that makes you feel motivated makes you feel positive and hopeful uh, exercise increases the availability of receptors saying like, I'm ready for you dopamine, I'm ready to feel good. Um, when we suffer from addiction, those substances are doing exactly the opposite. They're basically like shutting down the reward system and saying, I don't care what circumstance you put me in, I'm not rewarding you with those same positive feelings. Um, so this is one of the reasons why exercise can be really powerful as part of a, a treatment for recovery or support for sobriety because it actually is one of the only things that also has been shown to undo the havoc that substance use can cause on the brain uh, in a similar way that exercise can act as an antidepressant. Um, Andrew Huberman, uh, who's been on and, and certainly uh, talked with a lot of our members, likes, has this definition of addiction, which is a, a progressive narrowing of the things that bring you joy and pleasure over time. Yeah. And it, in some ways, it seems like what you're saying is that exercise or movement is almost opening up that aperture. And I know you talk yes. about in the book that adults um, past the age of, I don't know, 25 or what the age is, but as we age every decade, we're losing about 13% of our dopamine receptors. So it means that yes. we're less sensitive to um, that go molecule, that molecule that makes us like go and pursue things that ideally would bring us joy and pleasure. Um, but that exercise reverses that, that we actually start to see some restoration of that, which I think is just, it's amazing. Uh, and I don't know, I just, it 
such a... Um... I totally agree. It is amazing. <laughs> and right. So you see these studies where adults who have been regularly active, um, oh, I see we have some questions coming in too. This is great. Because what I love is that science actually gives us some some answers to these types of questions. Um, but yeah, that that people who exercise regularly, their brains look more like younger adults um, in every way too, not just the reward system, but also memory systems and learning and emotion regulation. Um, and it's, you know, it's so fascinating because exercise, it basically, it, it does what all known effective treatments, psychological treatments do for the brain. So that makes it a really good um, uh, addition to anything else that you're doing for your mental health, whether it's therapy or medications, or even, you know, much more intense brain interventions like ECT or deep brain stimulation, um, or transcranial magnetic stimulation that exercise actually has similar effects to all of those. And so, uh, can, can really support all sorts of mental health. While we're on, um, dopamine receptors and what does science tell us in terms of the amount that someone should engage in, you know, the 20 minutes or more of exercise for their, yep. um, yeah. Yep. So that's the, exactly it. So it's there, there actually are some pretty clear signals in the research and I can't say this for a lot of things. That's why I'm excited. Um, I would say if you are serious about um, improving your brain health or your mental health and treating exercise like, you know, like therapy for your, for your brain and your mental health, uh, it should be a form of exercise that feels good and also challenges you to some degree. You feel your heart rate go up, doesn't have to be the hardest thing you can do but it, you should really know that you are using energy, that you're gonna get that persistence high because one of the mechanisms for changing your brain is you actually have to get that kind of reward system and all that brain chemistry going, um, as well as you have to challenge your muscles to produce um, myokines and other chemicals that actually travel through your bloodstream to affect your brain. So we need a basic level of challenge or continuous movement, 20 minutes or more, three times or more a week. I think it should be every day, particularly if you're not really going hard, uh, there is, you do not need a recovery day for moderate exercise. Very, very few bodies require rest, a rest day from something that is, you know, less than an hour, moderate intensity. Um, you, you can be active every day of your life. Um, and it takes about six weeks if you, you have been relatively inactive of that dose of movement to start to see structural changes as well as functional changes in your brain. Um, the six weeks has been shown in both animal models of this work where they are, you know, having rodents exercise, which they love to do, um, or whether we're talking about humans and also humans who are uh, using exercise interventions for things like depression or recovery from addiction. Uh, it takes about six weeks. And over that period of six weeks, one of the ways you'll know it's working is uh, exercise gets easier or more pleasurable sooner. So one of the things I encourage people to think about and look for is we know that as people get more experience with movement, their bodies get more efficient at releasing adrenaline and other chemicals that you need to work harder sooner and enjoy it more. So, you know, if you're just starting out, you could be like 30 minutes into a workout and your body and brain are still trying to figure out is this for real? Do we care about this? How much adrenaline do I really need to release? Should I be rewarding this with endocannabinoids and you know endorphins? Your body and brain, they do not know how to do this if you have not been doing it. So people are like, there's no such thing as a runner's high because it might take weeks for your brain to pick up on this and figure out how to do it. So one of the things that you'll, you can actually physically notice is that you're working harder sooner in a workout, whether it's your heart rate or you're sweating sooner, um, you, or you feel more adrenalized and energized sooner in the workout. That's a good sign as, as is the afterglow. So the degree to which you feel really good for a workout, uh, those are signs that you're getting these changes since most people are not going to like be doing brain imaging on themselves. Um, I want to make sure I understand this correctly. So what we're talking about is exercise, these 20 minute doses of moderate at intensity. At least, yeah. At, at least three times a week. And at least. Moder 
at least, and moderate being um, maybe it's hard to, to sustain a conversation. Yeah, you could um, sustain a conversation. I mean, there, there are studies showing that particularly if you have not been active at all, something like walking could be very challenging for you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all relative. And I don't like to say um, like you have to hit this target heart rate. Um, but what it is, is it's if you if you remember that all of this is about pursuing a meaningful goal that requires physical persistence. If you think that applies to what you're doing, it probably does. And it could be something like flow yoga or swimming. And for some people it's walking and some people it's jogging and some people it's running. And as you get fitter, you can do harder things. Um, but if you don't have a voice in your head at some point that says, uh, this is kind of hard, do I wanna keep going? Then you might wanna look for a form of intensity that's a little bit harder. And the other thing I'll add that the science is really clear about, which I didn't know before I started researching my book, but this, this has come through so clearly to me that I feel obligated to pass it on, is that intensity amplifies most of these benefits. So if you can go harder safely and you're willing to, you will probably benefit more in terms of whether we're talking about the exercise high that has a, a lasting effect on your psychological health and your brain health, whether we're talking about the degree to which you form relationships with the people that you're exercising with, we know more intense movement forms stronger bonds with people, um, whether it's the sense of meaning and purpose that people get and how that translates into having more courage to face other problems in their lives or a sense of confidence to pursue other goals, uh, the harder stuff seems to pay off, so. So the, um, what we're talking about though is fostering um, optimal or maybe the best brain chemistry that we can that, that underlies resilience, health, intelligence, connectedness, purple, purposefulness, mm -hmm. all of those sorts of things. But what we're not talking about is, hey, this is the regimen for you to build muscle or to build cardiac um, endurance, cardiovascular yeah. endurance, or to build those sorts of things. And, and that is a whole, it's a whole nother thing. But what we're saying is, if don't really put words in your mouth, but what I think you're saying is that you can unlock the benefits of better brain chemistry through these small, relatively um, low level doses of movement. Yes. And it doesn't need to be incompatible if you have other goals like yeah. that. If you, if you are training for something and you're focused on endurance or you love the idea of getting stronger. And so you're really training for strength gains. Um, all of those can fuel the types of benefits we're talking about. That's the, the great thing too. I mean, you can find nuances in the research and people will make arguments that some forms of exercise are like really, really good. If what you want is an antidepressant effect or really, really good if you want to form social connection. Um, but at the end of the day, there's research supporting just about every form of movement in terms of giving your, you know, making your brain more resilient, more responsive to joy, acting as an antidepressant, all of that, you know, reversing aging of the brain, all of that, it, it all kind of works. So that's why then you get to say, what do I want to do? What do I enjoy? What's the positive challenge? And what puts me in a community that I want to be in? Amazing. You mentioned myokines um, in uh, just a couple of minutes ago. And this, I thought, and I know you've talked about this in a number of forums as something that was particularly exciting for you. But for me, it was it was a little bit of this aha uh, moment when you talked about myokines and, and what's happening with our muscles and the release of these hope molecules. Could you maybe share a little bit more about what's going on there? Yeah. Um, the reason that this was so mind blowing for me is um, it really makes you appreciate your muscles as this incredible resource. So until about, you know, maybe a decade or two ago, biologists had no idea that your muscles were basically an endocrine organ. So they don't just haul your bones around or stabilize your skeleton, but your muscles are actually producing all sorts of chemicals and proteins that they can push out into your bloodstream to affect every system of your body. So your muscles can make chemicals that improve your heart health, that regulate blood sugar, that, uh, that travel to your brain to affect your mood and your cognition. Um, and what we know is that your muscles, when they're stimulated through movement, that is when they release all of this great medicine into your bloodstream. So if you were to look at the sort of the myokinome or like the, the, uh, the natural, what's, what's in your bloodstream that's coming from your muscles, people who are inactive, they have 
totally different chemicals in their bloodstream because their muscles are not giving you access to this incredible pharmacy uh, that's going to boost your immune system and protect your heart. But when people are regularly active, their muscles are releasing all of these interesting chemicals into the bloodstream that are basically, it's like this, it's medicine for every system of your body. And the myokines that have been dubbed hope molecules are um, chemicals that specifically seem to make people more resilient to stress. That some of the chemicals that are released when you exercise, they're basically like antidepressants. And it's your muscles literally pushing them into your bloodstream when you move. And when they get to your brain, they can reduce anxiety. They can stimulate changes in your brain that help you uh, regulate stress and emotions. And that even help people recover from things like trauma and grief and depression. So like, what an amazing way to think about what movement is, is that it's like uh, an intravenous dose of hope, right? Every time you use your muscles. And again, because this is about your muscular system, you can lift weights, you can go for a walk, you can dance, you can swim. If you're using your muscles, you will get some of this benefit. Um, so I know so cool. the next time I'm, I'm doing something physically taxing, uh, usually every time I do anything these days, it's hard. I don't know if it's because I'm older or what, but um now what's going to come to mind is that like, oh, this is what it feels like to grow more hopeful that my muscles are actually releasing these things. And like, and that again is like, I'm always, I'm always get uh, a little bit um, fired up when I can find ways to reward the process and, and realize that, that the benefits are in real time. So that's, and this is, cool. this is such an, uh, an important skill that you are modeling right now, because we also know that one of the things that makes movement more enjoyable and meaningful for people is how they interpret the physical sensations of exercise. And for a lot of people um, who are new to exercise, they interpret every sign, uh, your heart rate increasing, breathing harder, sweating, feeling tired. They interpret all of it as, I am so out of shape, I am pathetic, I can't do this, I'm too old, I'm too big, I'm embarrassing myself. They just have such such instinctive negative interpretations. Whereas now, like when I sweat, I'm like, I'm amazing. Like this is this is proof of how hard I'm working. My heart rate increases, and I think, like I'm killing this, and I'm making my heart stronger. And when your legs get tired, you're thinking, this is what it feels like to get more hopeful. Um, so I, this is all true, but, and for people who are, who are here or listening to this, who exercise regularly, they might even have forgotten the, how instinctive it is to have those negative interpretations. But if you're someone who has them, I really encourage you to flip it. I mean, you know, the, the people who are the greatest athletes in the world, the strongest people in the world, they're feeling even more discomfort than you, right? They're just, they're chasing it and they're embracing it. It's not like, it's not like whoever you might put on a pedestal and view as being an amazing athlete or so strong, a great competitor, an amazing, you know, mover. They're feeling it all too, but it, it means something different to them. And it can mean something different to you. Amazing. You talk about um, something in the book that this idea that um, movement can affect us and our ability to change our most deeply held stories about ourselves. And so it's almost movement as a, as a pathway to shifting our mindsets. And I'm wondering if, if maybe you could share a little bit more about that, because I, I found this yeah. to be particularly um, uh, resonant and, and powerful. Yeah, I can give you an example from my own life. Um, so when I was in college and recovering from uh, some trauma that left me really anxious and afraid, um, someone encouraged me to do <laughs> He was a psychic at a gym, which is a funny story I tell in the book, encouraged me to take a kickboxing class. And that class, right, it taught me how to punch and how to kick and to feel fierce and bold physically in a way that, you know, I was used to dancing and doing yoga and just boxing was so different. And I started to feel uh, fierce, like a fighter. And I found that at a few different points in my life, including during the most recent, um, during the initial pandemic lockdowns, when I lost uh, so much in my life and was really isolated, um, that 
going back to boxing helped me tap into my fighting spirit and even literally the will to live. I remember having a conversation with my trainer during the pandemic where she was talking about how Muay Thai is a, a fight to live. Like you're literally fighting to survive. And that's not something that normally appeals to me. You know, I also study compassion and I have a cat on my lap right now. I'm a lover, you know, I, but I'm also a fighter. But what's so interesting is when she was talking about Muay Thai is like the, the fight to survive. I realized why I kept coming back to boxing in periods of my life when I was experiencing grief or depression, because it literally activated my will to live. And it, it just made me feel like a different version of myself, the one who was going to fight to survive. And I, I feel like when you, if you talk to people who love any form of movement, part of the reason they love it is it brings something out in them that maybe they didn't get to experience or express in other areas of their lives. And that in, through that activity, they feel strong, they feel hopeful, they feel joyful, they feel playful, they feel like anything is possible. Um, and so, you know, I encourage people to find forms of movement that, that feel like a story they want to tell about themselves and that it's not just the idea of it, but it's the physical action of it. You know, when it's the right activity, you will literally feel it as you're doing it. I am strong. I am a fighter. I can persist. I can endure. I am joy. <laughs> I'm thinking about like the dance classes I teach where 90% of the choreography uh, is what I call joy moves. So that literally like after class today, one of my, I teach dance class, a couple of dance classes every day. And after class, this woman just came up and she literally, this was, she was just like, and I'm like, that's right. That's exactly how I want you to feel after class. <laughs> like a little kid who's just so excited and joyful. Oh my God. That's amazing. I need to, I need to figure out which one is the, the graceful form of movement and, uh, and do some of that. Uh, I've never been accused of being graceful. <laughs> well, hey, you know, but it, as seriously, since you asked, I will give you the feedback that I've heard from people swimming um, and some form of mindful movement, either maybe yoga, dance, or bar. When people want to feel grace, those are the two that I hear the most, but particularly swimming. So that's Amazing. something that people don't often think about from the outside when you're actually doing it, the way that, that you are in the water, um, it's a really interesting physical sensation for a lot of people that oh, feels wow. like grace. I mean, it's, I know you swim, so I don't know, have you had that experience? Yeah. Just my swimming doesn't translate to the dance floor. So, um, maybe I just need to go right in and, and, and do dance and <laughs> work on my grace that way. But the, uh, I, I it's just, it's so fascinating to think about, um, movement as almost mindset medicine. And so pick the form of movement you want that you think maps to the mindset that you would like to cultivate or that you would like to work on and engage it and move your body. And then doing moving your body in its physical form, you start to incorporate some of the, um, some of what's going on from the mindset um, there as well, which I think is just, is fascinating. Yeah. And the thing that's so good about movement is because other people will witness it in you as well and reinforce it. So like when you are a runner, like people will also see you as someone who persists. When you are a dancer, people see you as someone who moves in ways that are joyful or beautiful. Um, when you strength train in a gym, those people see you as someone who's powerful. And so I feel like it's great because part of changing your mindset is having whatever that mindset is, having it reflected back to you by being in an environment that sees it in you and celebrates it in you. And, uh, and movement can be very powerful for that as well. Something that is going on when I imagine when you're engaging in these movements, uh, you talk about proprioception. So having an awareness of where your body is in space. And I would imagine some of this is also tied towards the interoceptive awareness and understanding what signals and cues your body is sending to you and how you can respond to those, whether that's in boxing or in yoga or swimming. Um, but I wonder, you mentioned trauma earlier. And so I wonder for people that may have had um, some experience with acute or chronic trauma in their lives, when they find they're sensing into their bodies that um, it works up to a point and then they're blocked because of that trauma. Have, is that something that you've experienced? And what advice would you give to someone when that happens? 
Yeah. So I'm not an expert in using movement for trauma. I want to mention a resource first. Uh, Lara Kudari recently came out with a book called, I think it's called Lifting Heavy Things, um, which is really a guide to using movement. Of She particularly does powerlifting and strength training, but she writes about how to use any form of exercise, how to approach it in a way, if you've experienced trauma, that is supportive for you. And so she gives really great advice about navigating sensations and triggers and environments and all of that. Um, but, but I can give you some basic ideas from the science. Um, one of the things we know is that movement, um, so when people have experienced trauma, they can become really sensitized to and also so avoidant of sensations associated with fear, stress, anger, increased heart rate, uh, breathlessness or breathing faster, muscle tension, uh, adrenaline. And so one of the ways that exercise can be supportive for trauma is it gives you an opportunity to experience those physical signals and changes in a context where ideally you're both supported and doing something that is enjoyable or meaningful to you. So part of how it works is that rather than avoiding all those sensations, you find a way to approach them uh, you know, to the degree that you're willing to, and it starts to change your capacity to experience them that then translates. This is true for all anxiety disorders, not just something like post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but you know, another way that, so that's, that's part of that proprioception is it's, it's about increasing your zone of tolerance for physical signals that can become really disruptive and intrusive when you've experienced trauma. Um, but there's also, it's not, you know, beyond the proprioceptive, there is the, the sense of meaning attached to it. And, you know, so many people will, will talk about the sense of being able to move forward through movement. You know, I talked to so many people for the book who, part of it is proprioceptive. I mean, like when you walk, run, cycle, swim, you know, you can literally sense yourself moving forward in life. So part of it actually is this physical signal, um, but there's also a meaning to it. And so movement can be about turning your energy and attention towards choosing to engage with life. You know, I mentioned boxing for me. And again, that, you know, because my instinctive response to negative events is to freeze. Something like boxing is really empowering because I need a fight response. But when you've experienced trauma or, or other challenges, I think we all go to, we, we develop these stress habits that are not helpful. So somebody who has developed in, in relationship to trauma, a really um, powerful fight response might actually benefit from something that slows them down like yoga or swimming um, or being in nature and, and feeling that sense of peace that comes, even if you're doing something very physically active in nature. So part of it is also figuring out, and this is not just for trauma. I mean, this is for all of us. Exercise can be a really great way to counter our, our most uh, destructive stress habits by teaching us a different way to engage with things that are difficult. The, um, uh, touching on the same subject, you, you mentioned the idea of the concept of learned helplessness. And I would imagine that whether the trauma is acute or it's chronic, that, that that plays a role, this idea that over time, if we feel like our actions aren't able to affect our situation, that we just shut down and we stop doing anything. We just truly freeze and, and don't move and continue to um, continue to suffer unnecessarily when we might actually have an ability to change our circumstance or environment or our situation. And so I, I love the idea that, that you put out there that movement um, in many ways can change our relationship to fear and uncertainty. And then through that process, give us agency and control as a means of working our way out of that state of mind. Uh, but I don't know, did, did I capture that correctly? Yeah, or? that's exactly it. And there are really two things that seem to help people do that to counter whether it's learned helplessness or other forms of hopelessness, uh, movement and helping other people. So, you know, you can choose <laughs> or you can find something that helps you do both. Like in the book, I talk about that group, Good Gym, where they get together to do these community projects to to make their community stronger, help people in their community uh, while also doing a workout. I like, think that's such a great, I wish, there are some things like that here in the US, um, but you know, I love how organized uh, and easy to access it is in the UK with Good Gym.
It's, it's amazing whether, whether you're doing something good for someone else, helping someone else, or maybe just moving your body, mm-hmm. the same principles apply that uh, at any dose, it's effective. And so yeah. even if you're just doing a small thing, that that small thing can be an entry point to the next thing, to the next thing, and then um, very quickly. There's, can there's no dose too small there. And for both of them, there actually is a dose that's too large. Right. Just like you can, you can burn out from overtraining. You can also burn out from overhelping. I know that's a different conversation, but um, I, I, do, I have a lot of conversations with folks on the, about compassion and compassion fatigue. Um, so yeah, but the no dose too small is like the really important message. Um, I love it. I love it. So shifting gears a little bit, um, we talked about the endurance high. We talked about uh, covered a little bit of, around what happens when we're working, moving alongside others, this collective joy and synchrony that, that comes from that. But you also talk about um, what you frame as green movement. So the idea of just mm-hmm. getting outside and moving. And and I thought it was really a great way of um, putting a point on it is that it's like, unlike an endurance side, like the mind altering effects of getting outside in nature are almost instantaneous. It's, it's immediate. And it's just the way that our brains and our bodies are designed. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about that, because I think for some of us that maybe, um, you know, I've had got some young kids, I've fallen out of shape and, you know, I'm, I'm far from where I would like to be. And the, the struggle in front of me to get to where I want to be seems too hard. Um, maybe just getting outside in the nature seems more accessible. So yeah. I'd love to hear. Let's your- talk about this two ways. So the, the quick way, I want to say that there are two things that can get you in a positive state almost immediately with movement. Um, So if you're somebody right who who is just starting out or you're trying to encourage other people to be active and you know it's gonna take six weeks for the brain to figure out how to give you an exercise high, um, one is being in nature in a place that you enjoy. So like, for example, if you put me in the wilderness by myself, uh, no, no, thank you. Put, I'm just not ready for that, but you could put me, you know, in a park where I can also see a city skyline and hear some birds. And also I know how to get home. Like that's my version of green exercise. So it's about being in a natural environment where you can see some nature, maybe hear some birds, see some insects, some animals, you feel connected to the world around you. Um, or it could be a really challenging wilderness environment if that is a positive uh, experience for you. So nature or music, and we haven't really talked about music, but that is something else to think about if you're trying to make movement more enjoyable and to get like that endorphin dopamine rush immediately. If music that you like will do that for you. Um, the cat's joining the conversation here. That's Moo, because she looks like a cow. Um, Kelly, we had, we had Ethan uh, Cross um, on a couple of months ago, and obviously he was talking about default, med, default mode network and chatter oh, yeah. and, and how to almost how to open the aperture and create some, some distance and separation. I know this concept of open awareness is something that you talk about that happens when you're yes. out in nature. Thank uh, you for pulling me back to this. Yeah. So I did want to talk a little bit more about green exercise and, and like why that's so powerful. So it is the case that a lot of people experience really profound shifts shifts in their state of mind when they're outdoors and particularly when they're moving outdoors. And um, it seems that moving in nature is like instantaneous meditation. If you were somebody who has trained in meditation for decades, like if you are that person who has sat and learned to work with your mind and you can shift your mind into the state of present moment focus, you're open opening your senses and all that inner chatter that folks might be familiar with that default mode, it quiets down just like people who are expert meditators. This seems to happen for a lot of folks spontaneously in nature. And um, when I was interviewing people for the book, I kept hearing from people who particularly suffer from what I call like the cruel default mode, people who deal with anxiety, self-criticism, depression, even suicidal thinking, that they loved exercising outdoors because it was profoundly different for them. It gave them a different state of mind for many of them. It was the only way of turning off that, uh, that inner chatter that was so cruel and harmful. Um, so it's another way to think about how exercise is, is, can, be, can be this major um, change in your state of mind. And part of it's biological and part of it's evolutionary, um, but that you can try this out for yourself. So I will, I actually think 
I think that people probably are more music or more nature <laughs> and like you should try both. So for me, uh, I'm going to get that quieting of the default mode through music. And, and that's my access to positive states of mind and hopefulness. And for a lot of people, it's going to be uh, being in nature. Amazing. Amazing. I love the fact that there's not one way and there are many mm -hmm. paths to this. So it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure and see what works for you. Um, you talk about the, the concept of the, the mirror effect. And so that we can actually proprioceive the movement of others. And oh, yeah. what I, what I loved about this is that it almost set the bar on the floor in terms of engaging movement to starting to feel some of the beneficial effects. So if you find that you're in a place where you just can't move for whatever reason, um, there is an opportunity for you to get some of the benefits of that without actually having to move your body yourself. Could you talk a little bit about that? Kelly? Yeah. And, you know, people who are athletes have probably, you know, heard about how mental imagery can stimulate your nervous system, your brain and your muscles in ways that are very similar to actually training. And it turns out that because the, the basis for human empathy is motor uh, mirror neurons, that your ability to see what someone else is doing and replicate it in your mind, actually see physical actions and understand them in your mind. It helps with cooperation. It helps with every level of connection, right? That's what the human ability to empathize and connect is based on. I see you doing something and I'm going to spontaneously create a model of that in my brain and also in my body. So when you watch people move, you're, you're getting a hit of that. I mean, it's why we love watching sports. It's one of the reasons we love watching sports or dance or people do you know physical stunts and obstacles and all of that. It's because when you watch someone move, your brain is gonna represent that and, uh, and give you a feeling of it and also prepare you for it. And so, you know, if for whatever reason, there's a movement you can't do, but you love, you know, I say, be a fan of it, witness it, celebrate it. Um, one of the stories that I wrote about was um, a woman who had such severe chronic pain and fatigue that she couldn't get out of bed, but she would listen to music and she would have these physical sensations as if she were making the music herself. Like she could feel what the musicians were doing to produce that sound. And as the music entered her body, it felt like she was part of that process. And I, I feel like we can all do that with movement as well. It's amazing, it's amazing. Man, the human body is just so fascinating. Um, and when we give it a little bit of help, it can do wonders for us. Um, yeah. Very, very cool. And isn't it nice to think of the body as this like, this is our vessel for experiencing life, not as this thing we have to drag around or this thing that's falling apart or this thing that's like a, a ticking time bomb of disease and all of the other ways that were something that other people judge that we have to make look a certain way. I mean, there's so, there's so many ways of thinking about the body that are the norm in our society. And one of the great things about movement when you find the right activity for you is it's gonna give you this direct experience of your body um, that is different, that will make you say something like, isn't the body fascinating uh, or to feel connected to your body in a different way. That's it. That's it. And, and to know that I think in finding that, that the discovery is part of the process and there's a lot of joy in the discovery, but when you do that, when you unlock it for you, you're going to unlock unique potential within you because you have unique experience and vision and what resonates with you is going to be different than someone else, but that there's opportunity in that. Um, Kelly, I know we're, we're coming up on time here in just a couple of minutes and you have a hard stop. Is there any final message that you would like to leave people with as it relates to movement or any of the research or, or great work yeah. that you've done? You know, there's something we didn't talk about that is was very important for me when uh, I was writing the book, which is to go against most people's intuitions, even if they don't say it out loud, is that, okay, you're talking about fit people, young people, able-bodied people. You're not talking about people with disabilities, people with chronic pain, people with serious mental health challenges, people of all sizes, I am. And it's why like, almost every example in my book is actually somebody who would not be considered your typical young, healthy athlete. Um, and one of the examples, I, you know, I, I don't think I even wrote about it, but I have not stopped thinking about it since I found the, the research and the, um, the examples of this 
is that exercise and movement are being offered in hospice centers around the world. And if you think about this and you imagine that you're at the end of your life and it's at a point where you have stopped trying to fix your body, that, that there's no way out in that direction anymore. It's the end of your life. You've got such precious little time left and people are choosing to exercise and like real exercise, you know, lifting weights and stretching and walking if they can that, and saying things like, I do this because it's the moment of the day when I feel alive and I feel hopeful. Um, it's how I connect with other people. And I think if you understand that at the end of your life, when you've given up all hope of fixing your body and you would still choose to move, I think that, that that's the message that I want people to have is that if, if anyone was listening and thinking I wasn't talking about them, I am. And it's just about being in the body that you have, moving what you can have and following your own thread of joy and meaning and hope. What a, what a, what a powerful, powerful message. Um, and to know that it doesn't matter what stage of life we're in, that movement is always available to us. And, and simply by moving, we unlock more within us and that life gets better and all the dimensions of well-being or happiness or whatever you want to call it, that we're healthier or more resilient or smarter or more connected. All of the things that we'd want to go in the right direction can come at any stage of life if we simply decide to move our bodies in a way that suits us best. Um, so amazing. Well, Kelly, I'm so grateful for one, for all the work you do and the way that you make science um, so actionable and accessible um, and, and just the, the service that you give the rest of us through your writings and research. So thank you for, um, thank you for that. Thank you for being here and thank you for inspiring us all to, uh, to move a little bit more. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who is here in person today. All right, guys. Take care, everyone. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Kelly. Bye.